In this video, I'm gonna answer your questions. So I posted my very first tutorial video. It was uh, Big Band Arranging Secrets Revealed, number one, back when I used to number them, closed voicing part one, or it became closed voicing part one. It was originally called closed voicing. And that video has grown and grown and grown, and it's sort of set off a new direction for my YouTube channel. I used to be strictly a music channel. Uh, my name's Elliot Deutsch, I'm a composer and arranger, and I've got an ensemble called Pandemonium Big Band, hence the name of this channel, Pandemonium Big Band. But the real popularity of this channel has sort of grown off of the strength of my arranging tutorials. And that was the first one. About a year ago, I had less than 800 subscribers to this channel, and now we've got more than 4,200. It's really a wonderful thing that so many people seem to be interested in my perspective and my process and just, I guess the way that I explain things makes sense to a lot of people and that's really wonderful. Since starting the tutorials, I've asked people to leave questions in the comments and I've usually given answers to those questions in the comments. <laughs> a lot of the, the questions have led to full on tutorials as well. Uh, like the tutorial I did about writing for a five trumpet section. That wasn't something I was thinking about writing, but enough people had asked about it that I thought it warranted an entire video. Well, some of these questions, the answers are short enough that I didn't think it warranted an entire video, but I've collected enough that I think it's worth going through right now. Marius said, great stuff, really very helpful and interesting. If I may ask, just why does trumpet not sound good in four part close voicing by themselves? And um, I guess my answer to that, well, he, Marius is referring to, to a bit of advice I've echoed a few times in my videos, which is when I'm harmonizing the trumpet section, I always support them with either trombones or saxophones or both. Uh, and the reason is that uh, the sound of trumpets playing in harmony without support, it very much dates the sound of the music. That's a texture that was used in the swing era and not so much since. Um, also, here if I pull out my piano, you can't see it, but the trumpets exist over here and the trombones and saxophones exist over here. So if we have the trumpets playing, uh, you know, this is a C6 chord, right? With a C on top. Like, this is trumpets. This is trumpets with trombones below. Much richer. So that's the reason we do that. Jonas Sento Brot, sorry if I'm butchering your name. Thank you so much. Your videos are really useful and well to understand. I think he means easy to understand. Could you recommend some basic arrangement literature? I'm studying music and want to improve my arranging and composing skills. Of course, I've already subscribed to your channel. Thank you, Jonas. All right, so the two books that were most important for me, um, the first one was by Don Zabeski and it's called The the Contemporary Arranger. That book's excellent. It, it's kind of a reference manual, but it's written in a really easy language, and it's speaking to commercial arrangers like me. Uh, the other one that I really super recommend is uh, Sam Unestico's The Complete Arranger. Now, there are two editions of this book, and to be completely honest, I only read the earlier spiral-bound version. It's shorter. The, the newer hardcover version is thick, and it's heavy, and I've heard that it's awesome, but I, I haven't read it myself, so I can't say. But I know it contains everything that the earlier spiral-bound one contained, and more. So I super recommend getting that book as well. The third book... I said two, two, but um, the third book that everybody seems to recommend is uh, called Inside the Score by Rayburn Wright, and that book is excellent, and all the information in it is excellent. I just didn't get as much out of it, I think, as the other two books. Uh, it didn't connect as well for me, but that maybe it's good for you. So definitely those are three books to check out. Bill Foote, I'm not sure if that's the name, uh, wrote, traditionally the term for voicing within an octave is close, as in close to each other, not closed. <laughs> it seems like the terms should be open and closed, but the terms are typically open and close. Well, um, <laughs> so I'm not sure it, where, where to put this. Um, a certain, um, this isn't exactly a trolling comment. I do get a, a number of comments with people trying to teach me about how I'm wrong. I, I don't know the, the right way to put it. So um, this was one of the very earliest examples of that on my channel. Um, in fact, it was that video on closed voicing uh, where I got this comment 
a few months after I put it out, and I was worried that I had taught everyone the wrong term. And I, I looked online, and sure enough, close is correct. <laughs> but so is closed. They're both used quite frequently. And where I went to school, everyone called it closed voicing. I have a master's degree <laughs> in jazz studies. I studied big band arranging as part of my degree in college. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that I'm using all the terms correctly, but I know that this was called closed voicing in the academic sense. Uh, whether close is technically right or closed is technically right or if it's a regional thing or if I'm completely wrong, honestly doesn't matter. The techniques that I showed in that video are really important and fundamental for big band 2D writing. So I don't know what to say. John Brownell wrote, Elliot with an extra T. I just love the way you copy and paste. For example, in your first video, you put the trumpet lines all into the sax staves with a simple click of the mouse. What software program are you using? Well, multiple, <laughs> you're actually asking a bunch of separate questions. I'm using Sibelius, but the copy and paste trick is actually just option clicking. And this is something that a lot of people don't know, at least on a Mac, I can't speak for PCs, but on a Mac, if you, so, if you highlight something, then hold down the option key on the keyboard and click somewhere else, it will paste a copy of whatever you had clicked. And I use that all the time when I'm writing music in Sibelius. I do note input with the uh, QWERTY keyboard and the mouse. That's just, I'm the fastest that way. Uh, I know that a lot of other people use a MIDI controller keyboard to input and they're faster that way. Uh, it doesn't matter, but option clicking can save you a lot of time. Tutorable, <laughs> tutor oneable, <laughs> writes, Elliot, great job and thank you so much. A question, if you'll allow, about the unison counterpoint. When or perhaps did you harmonize a counterpoint melody? Your video has been systematically helpful in revealing and give such great sound advice. Thank you in advance. Um, yeah. And then uh, just to add to it, Ken Rolls asked a similar question. I like your videos. Uh, but most of the stuff I know, I've been composing for several years. Um, but if you could make an in-depth lesson on counterpoint in big band arranging, that would be great. Okay, so a lot of people have asked for a video on counterpoint, and I don't really know how to do that. We don't approach counterpoint in the same way in jazz band arranging, or at least I don't, as you would in a college theory class, like first species, second species, you know, this many notes against that many notes, cantus firmus, and all that kind of stuff that doesn't really apply to jazz band writing. So when I'm thinking of counterpoint in jazz band writing, I'm thinking I've got a main melody and I wanna have some other melody going against it. And usually it's a matter of making, when, when the main melody has a lot of notes, the other melody either isn't playing, the counterpoint either isn't active at that moment or it's holding a long note. And then when the main melody holds a long note, the counterpoint has a bunch of notes. And that's it. <laughs> Video over, and then I could, I could play some examples. Um, now, the, to add to Tutorable's question, um, as a rule of thumb, of thumb, <laughs> I, uh, when I've got multiple things going on in the band, I will harmonize uh, one of them. As many as one, or as few as zero. So if you have two different melodies going on, both of them can be unison or octave unison, or one of them can be 2D and the other one can be unison. If you have both of them 2D, uh, the first problem is any of your non-chord tones are really going to rub against each other. So if you've got, you know, one holding onto this big chord and then another non-chord tone thing, you might have a bunch of half steps and all the instruments rubbing against each other. It's really awful. Um, the other thing is the unison or octave unison melody is going to get a little bit extra attention because unison or octave unison has more weight on those pitches than something that's harmonized 2D. So if you've got a big main melody, that's got a lot of volume, a lot of instruments on it. You could have three or four saxophones playing a counterline against it, but if they're in octave unison, they're gonna provide as much weight as eight other horns playing in 2D harmony. Peter Lewis Preston writes, what instrument library were you using? Sounds great. <laughs> Coco's Basement wrote, uh, great stuff as always. What's the horn sound libraries you're using in these examples? Um, <laughs> and similarly, Bill Coe, writes, very nice and useful video. I hear a slight difference, but it's subtle. That's referring to, um, I think, the difference between uh, types of passing chords. Um, but what are those samples? They're excellent. <laughs> okay, so 
The sample library that I've been using in the majority of my videos is not a sample library at all, <laughs> but I've been recording all the trumpet parts and I've been sending out uh, saxophones and trombone parts to uh, various members of my band who have graciously been recording parts and sending them back to me. So they've been recorded remotely and, uh, you know, layered together. If there's a bass, it's been uh, just the string bass sound from Logic is fine to me. But the horns are notoriously bad uh, digitally. And so when I have the opportunity, I prefer to record my examples so that you guys can really hear what it's going to sound like when the band plays it. Pablo Sunier writes, I love the videos. Hey, may you please make a video about how you make Sibelius swing right accordingly with the articulations. I remember you posted something about it on Facebook. Thanks. Okay, so um, the short answer is no, but the long answer, <laughs> no, I'm not going to make a video about how to make Sibelius swing right. Sibelius cannot swing right. I don't know how else to put it, but I think what you're referring to is an issue that I have with Sibelius, which is that it doesn't play marcados properly uh, in uh, the jazz context. So marcado, which is the little rooftop articulation, uh, should sound short and accented. A, a note with a marcado on it should be short and it should be accented. So it's sort of the combination of a staccato and an accent. But in classical music, a marcado is sort of a even more accented accent, but doesn't affect the duration of the note that it's on. So Sibelius, by default, does the classical music thing. Uh, if you go into the dictionary, which is uh, buried in Sibelius somewhere, you can actually change the parameters on all the articulations. So if you go into marcado, you just change the duration from 100% to 50%, which is the way that it plays staccatos. So at least the marcados will play like staccatos now. Neil Bevan says, I find your videos very instructive and your love for music is obvious. <laughs> Thank you. Um, one detail question, what sound set VST do you use for your mock-up ahead of hearing it with your band? Thank you. Well, uh, I don't do that. <laughs> I, so honestly, I use the general MIDI preset in Sibelius when I'm composing or while I'm composing. Uh, it sounds terrible. It sounds kind of like uh, my NES from my childhood playing back a big band piece. It's horrible, but you can really hear all the pitches perfectly in tune, and uh, it's good for hearing mistakes. That said, I've been doing this long enough that when I hear that playback, I'm, I've heard the transition from this playback to the real band enough times that while I can listen to the playback and get a feeling for how it's going to sound with the band. My experience of putting music in front of my band really informs the way I listen to the playback more than the actual sound of the playback. Mattia Chiapa, whose name I'm probably butchering, says, Hey man, awesome vid. You should really look into the plugin Note Performer for Sibelius. Really cheap for what it does and will improve the playback of your sounds dramatically. It's a night and day difference. And, well, you're right. <laughs> but um, I've used Note Performer. I, I downloaded it and installed it, and they give you a 30-day trial period. And for me, the sounds, sound, <laughs> the sounds sounded like it would be really great for symphonic music or scoring, but for jazz band, they just didn't really sound right. And it interpreted the articulations uh, in a very not jazz way. I don't know how else to put it. And I'm not alone in this complaint about Note Performer, that it, that it doesn't work for jazz band. I've spoken to a lot of other composers that write music in Sibelius or in Finale, but, and everyone that I've spoken to agrees that it does not work for jazz band. But uh, if it works for you, then wonderful. But I have tried, and uh, uh, until they make some dramatic changes, it, it doesn't work for me. Frodo Hotep writes, and I, this was on a, a comment on my video about drum, nota drum set notation. Uh, he writes, the assignment of ride and hi-hat lines, F and G space respectively, is standardized in blah, 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 blah. I prefer to reverse them for two reasons. All right, so he suggests doing it differently than the standard way for two reasons. Okay, the ride symbol is physically higher than the hi-hat. That's true. <laughs> Since the notation scheme for the drums is based more on location than pitch, it makes sense to follow the same approach in order to keep, thing, keep things intuitive. All right. Um, and then two, because the typical setup is rare for drummers to play the hi-hat in unison with the small tom-tom, 
It's very common to put the ride in unison with the small tom-tom. Placing the ride note on the F line makes it difficult to notate in a stack with a note in the E space, but on the G space, it's easy and visually clearer. That's why I submit that the accepted notation is poorly chosen. Okay. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what to say. Um, there are a lot of problems with the way that music is notated. Why do we have common time and 4-4? Four, four? Those both mean the same thing, or for that matter, cut time and 2-2. Two, two. Yeah, how come in swing music, uh, quarter notes are nebulous as to their duration? Are they short or are they long? You have to mark them all. Um, these are norms that deal with the shortcomings of written music. Now, if I'm writing something, I, I like the idea that if I write a drum part, that if a drummer who I've never met gets a hold of my chart, that they could read it down right away. So regardless of the shortcomings of the accepted conventions might be, I choose to stick with the conventions when it comes to notation. Go ahead and experiment with voicings and colors and instrumentation and all that kind of stuff, all that you want. But when it comes to notation and actually reading notes that are there, uh, writing something different than you want them to play is sort of a losing proposition. For me, when I'm writing sheet music, the goal is to have the musician playing what I want them to play with the fewest repetitions possible. So if I've done my job really well and I have a great drummer there and I've written my part very clearly, I should be able to count off the band and have them play exactly what I want in the first reading. And if I do things like write the hi-hat on the F line and the ride on the G space, uh, they're going to play the wrong one, even if there's a little word next to it. While nothing that you said was incorrect, I think that uh, you'll, you'll run into problems doing it that way. Brian Scott says, excellent clarification on the most important points about articulations for wind in a jazz commercial context. Um, perhaps you can make a follow-up video at some point on outdated practices to avoid vestiges of dance band writing likely, uh, like trying, like tying two eighth notes together with a marcato over the first one or using a tenuto over the string of eighth notes to indicate that they'll be played evenly and not swung. Do arrangers still do things like that? Um, no, those are those. The, you're right. Those are vestiges of the past. Um, notation changes over time, and in general, it gets clearer over time. I've made a decision with my channel generally to only say what to do, and not usually um, dwell on the wrong way to do things. So I really don't want to spend a lot of time describing here's the wrong way to do something and why you shouldn't do it that way. <laughs> So that's that's really the, the the only reason why I haven't put a video together like that. But um, if you're seeing those kind of things in an old chart and wondering why they're written that way, uh, it's <laughs> it's it's because they didn't know any better back when that chart was written. But we do now. Jackson Mack writes, "Great video. I'd love to know your thoughts about notating plunger mute. I've seen." Uh, many different arrangers do it different ways, and I'd love to know how you do it and why you think it's best. Okay, so um, full disclosure, I've only written plunger mute in a handful of charts, um, but I'm a trumpeter, and I've seen it done a lot of ways. So, or two ways. Yeah, I, I, let me just grab it. <laughs> here's a trumpet. Here's a plunger mute. Okay, so if you just write plunger on the chart, uh, it's a little bit nebulous. So. You, so basically the plunger can, can get a bunch of different sounds, which I'm not going to demonstrate because you know I don't have a microphone set up for it. But um, if you have it a little bit open is one sound, mostly closed is another sound. And especially in period style charts, you wanna have you know opening and closing effects, right? So the accepted convention is you write a uh, plunger mute at the beginning of uh, when you want them using the plunger mute and then over each note, you've got either a plus or an O. And plus means, you know, plunger mute mostly closed, and O means open. So you want do dat, do dat, you'd write that rhythm with, you know, pluses on the notes that you want closed and O's with the notes that you want open. If you want like a slow, like wah effect, usually you write in like, like a lyric, 
below the note, you write wah, W-A-H, and that means wah. Continuing on, do 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 Frederico Mendez Guitar <laughs> writes, hello. <laughs> Thanks for the video. What's your opinion on repeated notes for, on faster passages if other voices don't repeat? Uh, do you use line writing? A video on that would be awesome. Thanks again. Okay, so when you're writing for a section in big band and doing a 2D voicing, because that's, that's really what we're talking about. So if you're writing for a saxophone section, you have five saxophones, you're... I always approach it as lead alto is the melody. So I'll compose the lead alto melody first, and then I will voice it out. The sound that I'm going for when I hear them playing back is lead alto plus lower harmony. <laughs> and I want it to all sound like one section or like an instrument that is the saxophone section, right? That's what we're going for. An instrument changing notes has a sound and changing from one pitch to another pitch sounds like one thing and re-articulating the same pitch has a completely different sound. So um, in trying to keep the section sounding unified, you want them all to be able to match each other's articulations. And part of that is when lead alto moves up, all the other voices should try to move up. And when uh, lead alto moves down, the other voices should try to move down in general. Now, of course, there are effects where you want the saxophone spe section spreading out or contracting in, and those are wonderful moments, but I'm talking about in general, you want, them, you want all the voices moving in parallel, and you don't want any of the voices to stick out. And having you know, a first tenor going ta-ta-ta-ta-ta while the other ones are going boo-doo-doo-doo-doo uh, is going to stick out in a way that, that uh, you would rather avoid. And then it's just difficult to sight read a passage that do when everybody else is moving around. So there's that part as well. Bernard Maloney writes, very nice. Do you have a formula guide rules for voicing three horns in jazz? Trumpet, sax, bone. Um, no. <laughs> um, no, it, I mean, it, it very much depends on what style you're going for. So... Um, I guess the most important thing is uh, remember what tessitura the trumpet's playing in and try to match it in the other voices. So if you are, if you want it to have like a really edgy thing and you have the trumpet playing toward the top of the treble clef staff or even a little bit above, you're going to want the trombone playing multiple ledger lines above just to match the intensity of the trumpet and the saxophone can probably do it in any part of their range. Um, but uh, similarly, if you have the trumpet playing in their lower register, you should have the trombone and saxophone playing in their comfortable registers as well. As far as um, voicings, um, no, just try to keep your spread consistent and try to keep, if you're, if you're doing a 2D voicing, make sure that, that all the instruments move in parallel and make similar size intervallic leaps. So if you have um, one of the voice, if you have the lead voice moving up a fifth, you don't want uh, the second voice down going down a second or even going up a half step or something. You really want them moving up a similar size amount so that all the voices move in parallel and they all sort of sound like they're playing harmonies to the same uh, melody. Also, when you've got such a small section, a lot of times you can pick out individual harmony voices in a way that you can't in a larger ensemble. So it might be useful in the writing process to actually go through and play the lower parts and make sure that they're melodic on their own. Uh, so that when it all comes together, it'll be great. Also, <laughs> when you only have three voices, you literally cannot cover all of the harmony. So typically, if we've got a four-voice section in the big band, like, you know, trumpet section or trombone section, um, and we're dealing with five-note chords, we know that the bass player is going to play the root, so we can really cover all the rest of the voices most of the time, unless, of course, we have a root in the melody. So... But with a three horn section, you literally cannot cover all the voices. So if, like, if you've got a C major nine chord, there's no way to cover the third, the fifth, the seventh, and the ninth, four, um, with three horns. So you, because you can't, don't worry about it. <laughs> Allow the rhythm section to fill in the missing information and just put your three horns in a good part of their range. Tyler Mir Music writes, great video. I once spent an entire day talking to a client about what the word dark meant to him <laughs> because the first major thing he said to me was, don't write something too dark. Um, yeah, it's a great story and something that uh, any professional arranger can relate to. 
Uh, one of the most difficult things about music is talking about it. When I say talking about music, I mean talking about the feeling of music and the sound of music. When we're describing sounds, the, the really the most effective thing we can do is compare it to other things. Uh, ask the client if there is any music that they can think of that is so dark that they don't want me to emulate that. Or what, what are we trying to avoid? Or what's a recording that you're trying to emulate? Or what are several recordings that you're trying to emulate? And what do you like about them? Usually that's better than trying to actually describe it in words because uh, words stink and music is great. My goodness. Okay, well, I can't leave something like this without talking about the background music. Okay, so I'm actually, you know, I was gonna read a bunch of these things. I have a list of, I don't know, eight, but that's not even all of them. Uh, <laughs> clips of people saying, turn off that hideous background music and I can't hear what's going on and your background music stinks. And when I'm le learning about music, I turn the music down and all that kind of stuff. I want to remind you, first of all, <laughs> that that awful background music that we're using is Pandemonium Big Band. That's my band playing notes that I wrote. <laughs> so there's something... I, I don't know if ironic's the right word, but there's something that feels a little bit strange about uh, people that are com in one sentence complimenting all the information that I have about writing for big band, and then in the next sentence uh, telling me how lousy my big band music sounds. <laughs> so that's fun. A lot of my early videos had wall-to-wall -wall background music. Of Pandemonium Big Band, my music. That wasn't a good thing. And a lot of that speaks to my confidence as a videographer or as somebody making these videos for consumption. I'm not a videographer. I've learned a lot since you know the beginning of 2020 until now. But I'm still very, very new to making videos and editing videos and really it's sound mixing and all this kind of stuff. It's new, it's a wild and new Wild West territory for me. And I think that I was afraid that me speaking over silence would be aggressively boring. And if I put some exciting music underneath, it'll carry it through. And I don't think I was entirely wrong, <laughs> but um, it also speaks to, um, this complaint about the background music speaks somewhat to my problems with mixing. The background music was too loud. And I, did, I have remedied this, I think, over time. The, the, the music in the background is much quieter in my videos in the last six months than they were in the six months prior to that. And that's because I've heard what you said and I'm trying to do better. But um, <laughs> those early videos, a lot of them are about the most, the most fundamental topics, like how to close voice for big band or how to harmonize non-chord tones. And so they continually get viewed, which is wonderful. But of course, then I keep hearing the same complaints about something I literally cannot change. So I could redo the whole video, take it down and start it again. But you, if you've ever done anything on YouTube, you know that that's a losing proposition. And as of right now, there's no way for me to remix all the video's audio and resync it and load it in without just starting that video again fresh. And I really don't want to. I think those videos are really great. It's part of my history is putting this channel together and people are still viewing them a lot. I wanna talk about musical function when we're talking about this. So most of the videos that you see on YouTube are using um, music from either Google's free music library of, you know, music that won't flag copyright strikes because literally someone at Google paid for that music to be written and are giving it away to creators to use in their videos. Or people are subscribing to services that have just royalty-free music for them to use. So, um, but me as a composer doing a channel about jazz arranging, I refuse to use that garbage in my videos. <laughs> I'm talking about about writing for big band, the last thing I want is some kind of generic, generic, generic music track. It's, it, they're awful. They're awful and I refuse. Um, but, now here's the thing. The music that, that I am sticking in the background is concert music. So the music, big band music in general is concert music. And I don't mean concert music in the way that, that Beethoven's Fifth Symphony is concert music, but I do mean that I'm writing music for big band where the function is 
you show up to a jazz club and watch an 18-piece band perform it live on stage. That is the main venue for these arrangements. And so the music is supposed to be captivating enough that you would want to just watch and listen, and that's all you're doing at that moment. So sort of by design, it makes awful background music. See, background music is supposed to sort of set a vibe, but at the same time be non-intrusive. But the music that I'm writing for Big Band is specifically supposed to be intrusive and have twists and turns and be exciting and be loud and then soft and then, you know, doing all the things with music that we like to actually actively listen to does. So, I don't know. That just is what it is. Um, I'm going to keep using it. I'm, tr I'm trying hard to get rid of the music during spots when I'm talking about specific musical concepts because I understand that it's difficult for people to picture the musical concepts when they're also hearing music. But at the beginning of the video where I'm going, in this video, I'm going to show you how I make tacos or whatever, that part's going to have music under it. And then I go, uh, so don't forget to hit subscribe and leave a comment down below and click the like button. By the way, do all those things. Also check out Patreon. <laughs> and there's probably music underneath this right now because music is awesome, <laughs> all right? Um, <laughs> that was, that's, this is way too long. I'm sitting here at almost 45 minutes. Uh, hopefully I've been able to cut this down to, uh, I don't know, 41 minutes, and I will see you guys very soon. All right, goodbye. Pew!